Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Artist Talk on Art. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, the president. This is our 27th Monday virtual open studio. We have a nice group of about 23 artists today. Um, you artists are really what make this happen. We thank you for your time. ATOA has been around for over 45 years. It's a 501c3. What keeps us going is your support. And I want to thank all the artists who have sent us checks. You can take a look at our website, atoanyc.org. And if you like, you can make a contribution. But we do this for free. And I think we've built a beautiful community. And we're really enriching you know, everybody's life in a way. Our history was on the Lower West Side um, in New York City. And we're the longest running arts dialogue on the visual arts in New York City, actually in the United States. And this is our response to COVID and not being able to gather. And the advantage is Veronica Pena is here from Indiana. And we have a gallerist who signed on from Hilo, Hawaii. And we had a presenter mm -hmm. two weeks ago who was from Venice, Italy. So there are some windfalls, but you know, there's nothing like being in person. We're doing what we can. When things are better, we'll go back to our uh, formal in-person talks. Um, and we'll keep this going as well, because I think this has been a great format and it's been uh, really pleasurable. Um, so now I, I do want to mention we have a YouTube channel. You can look up Artist Talk on Art on YouTube and you will see I've been capturing the last talks, you know, many of the talks. And I also give a detailed description of what's gone on in the talks. Um, that's a way to see what, if you want to watch what maybe you have missed. Um, and as well, our website, atoanyc.org, I've set up a new section, a gallery section. This is a section for anyone who has presented at the ATOA, and we're gonna ask you to just submit one image, and we will use that image and help try and help sell the work of art with a 70-30 split. There'll be more details on the website. I'm just, we're really just rolling it out now. It's a, it is a, a, a column in our website, but it's not populated. It just has a little bit of information. To come later is a more formal virtual gallery that will be curated by two of our board members and they will make selections from that site and do thematic shows. And, you know, we're counting on help. Michael Krasowitz, has, we had a great conversation and he's offered uh, some help. And uh, I always refer to us as a beehive. We all sort of team up. During tonight's presentation, there'll probably be little technical difficulties. Just take your time. We're in no rush. Um, we always work them out. And we, you know, people step up like Fran Beeler all the time and help out. So without further ado, thank you all for coming. Um, I do have a few presenters who want to speak, and I'll start with them. And then uh, I'll open it up to anybody else. Uh, so again, welcome to Artist Talk on Art. We're going to start with Veronica Pena, and welcome Veronica from Indiana. I would say, uh, and keep in mind, I think everybody has done a good job. Um, when you talk, it can trigger your video and your audio for everyone. So if you don't want us to hear the children in the back or, or the TV or the radio, shut it off. But I do hear incredible silence. Um, and uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, Veronica, open up by telling us a little bit about yourself. And as everybody knows, feel free to jump in at any time, ask questions, give comments. Um, you sort of know the flavor and how we do things. So welcome and thank you for coming, Veronica. Hi, um, thank you for getting me here. Um, I had to say that I have been having some trouble with my connection today, so I hope it goes well. If you see me talking slowly, I'm doing it on purpose because I know there's some kind of delay. <laughs> um, Barry, actually, um, do you think I can share a yes. slideshow? Screen yeah. sharing, screen sharing is a great way to go. I've, okay. I have enabled it so you can screen share. Let me do that. If something goes wrong, just let me know because I am quite unaware of what people see. I usually give a thumbs up when things are going down. If we hit a problem, it'll be okay. obvious, but we always resolve it. <laughs> let me 
let me see. This one's too go off. Cool. Um, so I prepare for 15 minutes. If if there is more people that wants to talk, just let me know and I will short it out. Um, here we go. Let's see. Uh, I hope you can see it. Well, um, let me tell you that I, I, I am a little bit shy about presenting through Zoom. I have done performance art through Zoom, but uh, giving a talk or a presentation of my work is a little bit intimidating, so I will try my best. Veronica, <laughs> um, you're, you're amongst friends. Relax. Okay. <laughs> we all have the same intrepidations. You're te technically, everything is working perfectly. Good. Just go <laughs> slow. You, you've got your time. Just relax. Okay. That's how we do it here. Thank you. That makes me feel much better. <laughs> well, um, my name is Veronica, and uh, I, as I mentioned, uh, I am uh, originally from Spain, and I have been living in the U.S. for around 12 years or a little bit more. Um, I am a performance artist, and I am also an independent curator. So basically, I organize performance art exhibitions, and I also practice um, the discipline. Um, let me give you one. Where so, have you Where have you organized some of the some of the performance art? Well, yesterday, I mean, you mean like for a like as a curator or as a or as an artist? Actually, both. Both. Well, as an artist, I have been performing uh, in the, I have performed in the Queens Museum, Franklin Furness. Uh, I have been selected for Creative Capital, Taller, what else? Um, Triskelion Arts. I don't know, plenty of, of spaces in New York. I also studied in Stony Brook University, so I am quite familiar with the area of Long Island and, and I used to live in New York. I used here because of the pandemic. Um, and my husband. <laughs> um, and in terms of curating, well, yesterday I just curated an exhibition with a performance art space in Spain, in Madrid. It's called uh, uh, a small performance art event. And um, I am also the founder and director of a uh, performance art community on Facebook. We are around 10,000 people and uh, we are starting to put shows together. I, I founded this group in 2011 and it has a slow, a slowly started to grow. And now it's kind of building itself. I don't know very well how, but uh, it seems that once a lot of people get into a group, more people get in. <laughs> Um, That's very impressive, 10,000 in a group that you founded and curating in Spain yeah. or performing in Spain. And you did mention the Whitney Museum, correct? And the, Queen, the Queen's Museum. The Queen's Museum. Yeah, I wish I would perform in the Whitney. <laughs> Maybe sometime in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, the community, the Facebook group become bigger because what we do is we share performance art open calls. So it's a way of sharing resources and opportunities with people that is inter interested in the discipline. And I guess that's the reason why people is responding so well. Um, I am originally not a performance artist. I was a painter. So I knew how difficult it is to get into a discipline that is not the one that you are used to, you know, how to get the connections, start knowing people. Uh, the artist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I used to be a painter and uh, I came to the US with the idea of finding interdisciplinarity within painting, but um, something happened. Um, my father uh, died. He, he took his own life. So after he did that, I couldn't paint anymore. I, I couldn't. So one day, instead of applying paint on the canvas, I started to apply it on my body. And uh, in that way, I, the gesture of covering, awaiting, and stillness 
became the base for my performance art. It was a very intuitive transition from painting to performance. And let me see. I put some videos, I test them. Let me see. If please, if you cannot see it, let me know and I will try to fix it. <laughs> I'll give you thumbs up when I see everything working. Okay. <laughs> um, so I would like to show you um, a video that is related to a project that I call The Body in the Substance. That it was to be premiere at Pioneer Works, uh, which is in Brooklyn, on November. But with the pandemic, it got postponed. Um, I have no date anymore, but this is a large scale installation performance. So I hope I can get to do it and get the funding for it because right now everything is uncertain. Um, so I'm going to play the video and maybe talk why you see it. So the body in the substance is a performance in which I submerge my entire body within a liquid material that slowly solidifies. When it solidifies, I cannot move, I cannot see, I cannot talk, and I cannot hurt others. What is that, a liquid form? Yes. <laughs> and the body inside the substance is for me the immigrant body, the female body, uh, defined distance, separation, revealing a strength and trust mm -hmm. in others. And it's a liquid material. I call it, um, it becomes solid eventually. I call it the unknown between the here and there, past and present, life and death. For me, um, stillness and confinement are a means to achieve and communion with others, either present or absent. Veronica, let me ask you, what do you think about when you're when you're in that performance, what thoughts are going through your mind? Uh, everything. <laughs> no, um, you know, at the beginning, because I used, I used to be inside the material for uh, several hours. I have been able to do um, six hours, but my body cannot take longer so far. And the type of thoughts, you know, at the beginning, I am very focused on breathing and trying to feel calm inside that media. Um, I uh, breathe through a breathing tube and um, I don't oh. know, it's just, okay. I have to control my breathing. And um, sometimes I am more, I think about the body. Other times, you know, I am, I, my head goes different places, but for me, being inside the liquid is an act of hope uh, for something maybe irrational to happen. You know, a re-encounter. My work is very, um, trouble with separation and absence. So for me, it's a way of also telling in the limits of the body and of the human essence. Um, let me see. I, I hope, Barry, I hope that answer a little bit to your question. Uh, um, per perfectly, perfectly. <laughs> Can, Can the comment? It's Susan. Uh, I absolutely cannot imagine how you did that. <laughs> Looking at just watching, you know, the, the thickness, the, the, the glue of it. I, I, it's amazing to me. I, I give you all the credit in the world. Thank you. Yeah, the images. Yeah, you know, for a long time, I kind of confined my body with materials that were harmful 
or suffocating because I was feeling kind of guilty. And um, over time, I developed to a more positive version of covering. And I understand this liquid as a caress to the body. It's actually, uh, at the beginning, it's a little bit difficult. But once you are in, it's a, it's a good experience. And there is a difference in how time passes. Like at the beginning, one may not look like two hours, but at the end, two hours look like a, a minute. So something happens with time there that I find, I, I'm too curious. <laughs> um, I, I have a question, two que well, I don't know. First of all, the position did not look particularly comfortable. You were like <laughs> sitting bent over with your head upside down and you're yeah. that way for six hours? Yeah, so, this is yeah. the first version of it. Uh, so in the body in the substance, I submerged my entire body. Oh. And in this one, was, that was my first attempt. I only submerged the head. Mm. And you are right, it's not a comfortable position. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Because, um, you know, you, it's, it's actually an exercise of strength and of resistance for me. Mm. Um, and, and how do you get out of the liquid once it solidifies? It solidifies close to a gelatin, like it's not oh, hard rock. I, I just okay. don't know how to say it better. <laughs> gelatin sounds good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I tried something that was more solid, but it was too dangerous. So, mm -hmm. you know, not, yeah. not a good plan. Yeah. Um, let me show you. I do a lot of participatory work because I use performance to create uh, unity. I try to create certain moments amongst the strangers with the hope of promoting empathy and trust. It's, this is kind of my idealistic work. Um, so for... Square? Yeah, this is Times Square and this is 2010. So for me, let me stop it. I try to, you know, for me, one part of my and my work is to try to eliminate um, barriers to human unity, barriers such as migration, politics, uh, borders, um, physical distance, displacement, pain. Machis machismo, cultural segregation, and I do all of this in, in a search for liberation. Um, you know, for me, performance art um, is a, it's a direct expression of the body. And um, I like to perform in the public space because it allows me to, you know, it's like uh, being able to communicate with others, um, to express a desire, a wish, is also an exercise of resistance. Um, it allows me to talk about stereotypes and to create situations that it will not happen if performance will not, um, make them happen, <laughs> sorry, I'm repeating myself. So this is uh, 14th Street. You know, there's a festival every year. It's called Art in of Places. And I use this material to change my appearance and to talk about uh, different social, economic status, um, about the gender, about what we are used to to see and not. Um, this is another work where, you know, I like to create, to constrain the body and then to try to free myself from these um, circumstances. And so it's, a, it's an act of liberation. 
every, and different works have different poetics. Um, here, I happen to have an injury in my arm, and uh, I have my I was deprived of movement for some time, and every time I I try to do something, I the rest of my body has to respond to that. And uh, the the problem was a ligament. So thinking of the idea of ligaments, I started to think about um, the ties of the system and how we are under the control of others sometimes, on the, and how to free ourselves from that, or at least to try. And I wanted to finish by showing you, um, oops, it runs. <laughs> I work, um, you know, with the pandemia, it has been everything, uh, all the performances that I had got canceled. And uh, I guess it happens to many of us and in the different disciplines that we have. And I tried to, you know, at the beginning I try, I was kind of blocked, but then I tried to, uh, my way of thinking was I had to do something with what I have. Uh, so that's when I started to do more performances uh, through Zoom and to share the world through this media. And here, you know, this is by, in order to do the body in the substance and to remain under the material six hours, um, I had to train my body because the water is heavy, it presents your lungs, and it has different things. So for two years, I have been doing a training that consists of being inside a, a water tank and just staying there, just to train my body. But with the pandemia, being inside the tank became my way of, um, of finding balance. And uh, a certain degree of, uh, stability within all the things that were happening and that are happening. Um, and I'm, I think that I can share this one too. This is also done during the pandemic and I'm just going to move it. So here I was trying to experiment with um, Zoom. Uh, what can I do with this media? So this is live performance, but uh, I am using the capabilities of this platform to see what can I do with it. So during this performance, I become what I call a creature. And I explore themes of isolation. And uh, I come back to the idea of covering the body, but this time under the new circumstances. So, and um, here I use plastic wrap, which was one of the first materials I use. And here you can see how it changes. This is using Zoom. So Zoom allows me to go live and then to, to change it to, to become this green creator. And here I was thinking about of ideas of, um, protection um, and, you know, just trying to figure out what can I do from my home and how, what the things that I have here inspire me to, to do something. It's a very smart usage of common materials, especially the string, the way it impresses into the body and it makes a very strong statement. Um, and at the same time, using the, the digital manipulation to get this kind of an image as well. Let me ask you, um, do you capture photographs or are you strictly concerned with the performance? How do you make it uh, less ephemeral? I mean, you do have the video here. Um, how do you approach um, that? It's always a problem for performance artists. Yes. Um, I... I had to become more organized. <laughs> I, I have been more concerned with my, 
Let me put this one. This is another one. I have been more concerned with performance in itself and not giving too much um, dedication to selling or to showing the byproducts of the documentation of it. Um, like I, I have very, not too many exhibitions, it's more performance art. But now I'm realizing, saying that with Instagram and publicity that is, is good now that I don't have the possibility of performing so much, uh, it's good to promote the work in different ways. So I'm now exploring how to document the work um, in a way that it doesn't lose the essence for me, but it still creates a beautiful memory of it that I can share. Like I normally saw videos uh, and I, Sometimes I share pictures, but not, not that often. Well, I will say you, you definitely belong in the Whitney Biennial. There's no question <laughs> about that. They do have performances become a big part of that show that happens every two years. And your work is incredibly moving, rich and deep. And yes, mm -hmm. scary in a way. Would you consider yourself a surrealist in some way? Uh, yes, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's a difficult question to answer quickly, but I can say that I do um, have been influenced by, you know, the yeah. tradition in Spain of surrealism and um, I studied Dali, I studied painting in Spain, so I'm very, you know, my work is kind of aesthetically driven by my background in painting. Like I, every time I do performance, I think of the interaction, but it's not so raw as other performance do. I, I pay a lot of attention to the visuals and to how things um, look like. And yeah, I actually, you know, I am also studying psychology and the ideas of dreams and the interpretation of, uh, you know, the interpretation of uh, it uh, in connection with surrealism has also been present. Um, but I don't do it on purpose. <laughs> I understand. Um, are you familiar or a fan of Luis Bunuel's film? Uh, yes. <laughs> I would imagine. And how about Marina Abramovich? Yeah, see, actually, you know, uh, yeah, I, Marina Abramovic, I knew about her too late. And, uh, you know, because I didn't know at the beginning, I, when I was a painter, I had no idea about performance art. And the scene in the US has been always kind of more active, I believe, than in Spain. And, um, so it took me some time to get exposed to some of the well-known artists of the field. But yeah, um, I love the work of Marina Abramovic and, uh, and also Ana Mendieta. Um, I tried to, you know, I transitioned into performance kind of creating paintings in volume because there was a moment in which I interacted with the canvas. And so there, there is a, a lot of organic, organic, I don't know if I was going to say organicity, but I don't think that's a word in English. <laughs> it's a very organic process. And I, I like to see the work of um, several artists, but I think I'm still more influenced by painting uh, you know, like for instance, the Garden of Early Delights, that was the, the last performance I saw, I saw was inspired by that painting. Mm. And bringing the, uh, you know, I thought, you know, what happened if I bring one of the figures of the painting to life? And uh, I always, or not always, but I have a tendency to put the body in a vulnerable situation. Um, like in that performance, I'm wearing a grape head that is like 20 pounds and I cannot see and I cannot remove it by myself. 
and uh, I'm wearing a bodysuit, but um, I am basically naked. So it's an exercise of, of trust in others. And I have a tendency to do that. The same thing with the, when I submerge my head inside the substance, like people can, can approach the performer and they can do anything they want. And so far, I don't know if because I perform in a protected space, sometimes because it is a gallery, sometimes because the videographer is there, or sometimes because people is nice, uh, nothing, nothing has happened. And, and, you know, I think it's a beautiful interaction to promote uh, unity. I think it, it's oh, yeah. nice you are, you are vulnerable, you do expose <laughs> yourself, you do lead with trust, and then you get responses with trust. I think that's sort of the way the cycle works. Um, let me open it up to questions and thoughts. Leah Poller. Yeah, I think if uh, Goya had been a performance artist, he'd be doing something like this, <laughs> right? You almost have to be Spanish to reach this particular type of expression. How is it received in Indiana? I can't imagine it would be the same <laughs> in uh, Times Square. Uh, well, you know, I, I spent a lot of time here uh, because uh, my husband had a good opportunity here at Purdue. In the, you know, Purdue University is in Lafayette, which is the town where I am living right now. So at the beginning, when I arrived here, um, there was a big difference between the environment of the university and other areas of the state or, or the city where I am. And uh, I approached Purdue and uh, I, you know, I'm very social, so I have a tendency to know a lot of people and to invite people to things. And um, we did a first, if, uh, I did a program of performance art and uh, we have a very you know like when i told the galleries i wanted to do this performance and i want to bring an artist from new york and we are going to do this and that she said okay do it she did do she said yes based on the based on my artwork but when the day of the event came she only put 12 chairs on the gallery so I thought that, you know, she was not really expecting too much people, but at the end, uh, 60 people showed up. So, you know, and people was interested. So sometimes there is a stereotype of um, the more rural or isolated um, state, but uh, it, it depends if you know how to reach people. But evidently here, they are well not evidently but my experience is that they are more traditional um more into conservative theater but there is people that is curious about other other things i want to read, I read, I want to read some of the things in the chat uh reagan true true said such powerful work veronica i'm happy to get to tune in to hear you speak about it and sadly she had to go uh, Robin Halpern said, agreed, it's very powerful. Some of it is both visually and emotionally wrenching to watch. Great work highlighted. Uh, Elaine Forrest, beautiful Veronica. The saran wrap performance reminds me of pupa stage of the butterfly. And certainly I would think transformation. You are somehow transforming yourself from this world to a world you've created. And I think we've seen that as a trend in artists and their work. And, uh, and I think to some extent, you can't ignore the fact that you had a terrible experience of your father passing. And when I saw the mummified picture image and I saw some of the things, I've said to artists, when certain work is created, it means the artist was burned in a way. And you and had an experience that, that hurt you hurt deeply. deeply. And as a and result, you reacted. And, and your reaction is healing for you, for you. But it also it takes also your art to a very deep level. level. I could not do something like that. 99% of the people 
cannot. You almost need a tragic event and then be able to live through that and to express it creatively as you did. And Excuse me, I'm so sorry to interrupt that echo. Susan Tiffin, you have two devices. You need to turn your volume. You need to turn your audio. I have no audio on. I had it all off and I'll turn it off again. It's not me. I, I'm aware of that. Oh, okay. someone, someone must have just done it because it did fix. Thanks okay, for pointing good. that out. <laughs> Keep an ear to that. Um, a, a good question. Uh, Regina Silvers asks, is this very different from your early work, from your painting? I too was thinking, what was your painting like? Um, well, uh, I started, well, I, we, I, I could have shown some of my paintings. Um, I had landscape. I used to paint landscape. And, um, you know, I actually, I can hear myself too. But I used to, I used to paint landscape and um, also autobi autobiographical stories. Um, Partially, you know, sometimes I talk about the loss of my father in a way that it looks sometimes maybe, or I think that I, sometimes I cannot believe that I can talk about it in a, such a natural way uh, because, you know, losing somebody in that way, in a way that you cannot say goodbye and uh, that, it, it, you know, my my family was very unstable and that was one of the reasons why my my artwork uh, was autobiographical and uh, so I, I used to use symbology and uh, here comes surrealism somehow <laughs> and um, and uh, I used to do very you know foggy kind of no fo my paintings ha hardly had any limit they were all kind of blurry and uh, that's what you know when when i decided i couldn't paint i i just couldn't even look at my work anymore like i i have been disconnected from my painting for a very long long time and uh, I, I cannot believe we are talking about it actually <laughs> um yeah, I have um, this, you know, I um, try to be, at the beginning I, I was in a lot of uh, internal pain because I understood, but I did not understood. And um, after years of uh, feeling negativity, even if beauty was present, I felt, I felt that my work was too dark. And um, then I took a more positive approach to it. That's when the caress versus suffocation of the body. And instead of talking about, um, you know, being talking about uh, the experience of uh, abandonment or the experience of isolation, I started to create, uh, instead of thinking about separation, I started to think about unity. So I, consciously try to step out of the of to a more positive um, idea and uh, coming back to painting lately i have been trying to think i want to paint again uh, but i will do it in a way that it is performative so that's kind of where i am right now <laughs> um i do want to quote aaron uh, Peacer said, the work is visually arresting, Veronica. Thank you so much for sharing. I am loving the reflections on mortality and the visceral response the work brings about within my own body. You definitely have touched all of us with this presentation and I'm sure with everyone who ever sees what you do. It is very moving work. Um, brave. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very brave. <laughs> My self-esteem is up. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was brilliant. It, it's almost hard to clap for it because it was so, it was so hard in a way, but in a beautiful way. Very powerful. Very. Yeah. 
Oh. Art is always good. <laughs> that's, that's nice that you have such a positive attitude towards it. And, you know, you will be in the Whitney Biennale. I have no doubt about that. I gar I'll make that call. Cross fingers. I, I see the work you're doing. And you will be, and you, you may be in Venice one day, so no question. I do want to say to everybody here, we, we may not have your emails, so look at our website or send me an email, and I'll make sure you get on our list. I see lots of new faces from different places and lots of names I'm not familiar with. It's very nice to see the group expanding like this. Thank you so much, Veronica. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Could yeah. I ask a question? Yes. Um, since you have background also in psychology, um, I was curious about claustrophobia because by watching your performance and uh, images makes me feel claustrophobic. <laughs> so uh, I say beautiful, but it comes to my claustrophobia. Yes. Um, well, let me uh, let me re reframe myself or rephrase. Um, I am studying uh, psychology, but I am not an expert on it. Uh, like I'm just studying it, uh, just because I always wanted to. And I, I am in my forties crisis, so I needed to do something. <laughs> um, but yeah, claustrophobia. You know, many serial people has described. Uh, the, you know, when the people that have seen the performance inside the water tank uh, for longer time, and uh, they have talked about anxiety. And uh, I do understand the feeling of watching the body enclosed as claustrophobic. Um, I have invited, you know, I like to share my work, not only talking about it, but I, inv I like to invite people to perform it. And I also perform for other artists uh, just because of the work. I like to make things happen. And um, there has been only one person that so far that is willing to submerge, for instance, the head uh, inside the water tank. And we are working together. We're doing the performance together. But uh, for the large water tank, I do agree that the vision of it um, feels like you are enclosing something. But However, you know, it, the way you are now, if you close your eyes, that's more or less what I feel when I am inside the water or inside the liquid. And you are kind of floating, well, you are floating. And uh, it's a, it's, it, it may convey claustrophobia, but it feels actually quite, um, open when you are inside and uh, I actually use the walls of the water tank to keep myself underwater sometimes because at the beginning it's hard to remain underwater the, the body has the tendency to float as the time passes the body has the tendency to to align in the center of the of the water tank but at the beginning I use it to to hold myself and uh, for me, it's good to have those walls there because it tells me that I am not in the middle of nowhere. You know, it kind of brings me back to to the place where I am. And that kind of uh, goes to what Barry was asking at the beginning, what where your head goes. Well, sometimes it, it, it goes to, it comes back, it comes back because I feel the walls of the water tank there. Mm -hmm. Sounds, yeah. sounds almost womb womb like yes like uh, comforting um yeah yes. i from having from being a scuba diver i can say that uh the idea of going underwater can be anxiety provoking but once you get under there and in it it is kind of amazing i mean we are made of so much water so yes. it brings that and, uh, to mind I, I I don't do uh, a scuba. I don't know how it is when you come back, but when I leave the tank after several hours, it's an, a struggle to get out because I get very dizzy. When I am mm. fine when I am inside, but when I go outside, I look very very pallid, and it's hard to. Mm. I really had to lay on the floor because. Uh, it is a, a big change when you are inside for a long time. 
I think it's a little different from scuba because when you're scuba diving, you're moving constantly and, and using your body. So there's not that sense yeah. where you're, you're being mostly still in the water and then you have to move again with gravity. Um, but it is disorienting going from water to air and air to water. It's that change of, of medium is, uh, is intriguing. Um, I love the work. There's a, a man who does this kind of performance art. He, he's been in Lincoln Center numerous times, man in the bubble. I don't know. He goes into water and stays there for days. Oh, really? I didn't know that one. Mm -hmm. I have to think of his name. Yeah, you don't I'll try to know. find it. Okay, <laughs> and if I find it, I'll put it in the chat. Thank, thank, thank you. you again, Veronica. Thank, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, we're going to move on to Suzanne Starr. Suzanne Starr is in from uh, Hilo, Hawaii. Um, Suzanne, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, you're going well, to laugh, I but I, I'm having a little body anxiety. <laughs> oh, just relax. We're all relaxed here. You know, I have a nice shirt on, but it's pajama bottoms underneath with slippers. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very casual group. Um, everybody gets anxiety when they talk. And the way you get over it is you start talking and then everything <laughs> just starts to go. So you relax. Give us a, a little bit about your history, um, either now as a gallerist or as an artist, as you prefer. Just start talking and you'll, you'll fall right in, Suzanne. Okay, I was just going to add to my comment. I feel like I need to get into that jelly tank with Veronica. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't say it twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, interesting. I ended up in Hawaii um, after my husband and I went on an 18, 18 month sailing um, journey. Um, we sailed the Sea of Cortez for a year and uh, sailed the South Pacific. And uh, prior to that, him and I were both in um, medical as well as a combination of medical and business. And um, I found myself, uh, when I moved to Hawaii, um, I was still doing a little bit of medical practice, not as an MD, but as a nurse. And um, it, I found myself uh, doing artwork in a, a textile format. Um, using the silk screen process and I did wholesale um, with my textiles with about 50 accounts all throughout the Hawaiian Islands for almost four years and then I got kind of tired of running around <laughs> so I decided um, to open up a retail gallery and I opened up the gallery dreams of paradise and our website is the name of the gallery um, dot com so dreams of paradise gallery dot com and um, we primarily represent artists of Hawaii. I have a few international artists, but the majority of them um, are uh, local. A lot of them are primarily the Big Island, which is where I live, uh -huh. and as well as um, my artwork. So um, what happened to me, interesting, we all have our stories, right? Um, what happened to me, um, almost two years after opening the gallery, I came down with cancer. <laughs> And um, I had colorectal cancer stage three. Um, but with my nursing background, and I did uh, holistic studies at UCLA, which actually a certified health consultant program, um, I was very much in tuned as well as from working in ICU, what happens to people when they're ill um, and when they're making transition, and that there's other powers involved in our wellness. Um, and I think, Veronica, through your expression of um, your psychological wounds because of the loss of your father and using the art as a healing um, modality um, was also for me um, when I was recovering from cancer. And uh, I will share this, which is pretty amazing, and maybe this will help you, Veronica, and maybe that's why you and I are on at the same time. But when I was ill, um, I had this amazing dream about three o'clock in the morning and I was in this twilight phase. And I, I'm, I'm sure Veronica, you can relate to that because when you're in those, those states, you're, you're in this in-between physical, non-physical world. And I had two angels come to me um, they, and they did not have wings. <laughs> 
And to make a long story short, um, they sent a healing light and the tumor shrank and went away. So um, I'm 68 years old. At that time, I was 41, 42. So I've been 26 years cancer free. And uh, after that, I did a, a healing retreat for women recovering from cancer for about seven years. It was called the Art of Dove, a 501c3. And we use nature, uh, nature and art, and we get on a sailboat and go out and sail with the whales and um, be in touch with um, more natural energies in healing rather than the medicinal medicine, so on and so forth, cut and snip. So um, as, as, as I... As, continue to um, heal and get well, um, I moved more into, um, you know, uh, two-dimensional art in the sense of doing watercolors and pastels and oils. And during the time that I've had the gallery, which is now 28 years, I've done multiple oil commissions for people. And my, and as y'all know, you know, your passion in art moves. <laughs> you don't get stuck in one medium. And so I've been doing a lot of uh, photography um, presently. So um, that's what I'm doing now. So um, if anyone wants to ask me anything before I go into some of image presentation, go ahead. You're okay? <laughs> Everyone's okay? Wow, that was quite a, an, a very inspirational story. So I'm just looking forward to seeing all the work. Okay, great. So I'm going to, and I'm, this is, J Barry knows this, because <laughs> Barry and I have had a couple of trials on doing Zoom. This is like the third time on Zoom. So I will do the best I can, and I hope it all comes together. So I'm going to go ahead and start sending um, some pics. So, okay. While we're waiting, so, I do so, want to mention, so, uh, go ahead, Barry. I do want to mention next week, next week we have a good naked gallery, gallery, a Brooklyn a virtual, virtual gallery, gallery that's going to have that's about six artists present. Artist present. It's going to be very interesting. Very interesting. I'll put I'll something, put on, something the website on the website for anyone who, for wants, anyone to who wants to have a little preview and know preview preview what's coming. coming. I promise it'll be very it'll interesting. Be very so which gallery? It's good, good naked, naked gallery. gallery. I'll type it oh, in. And by the way, there is a way chat function here. here. I am still I getting am still that, getting that. Um, the echo. Um, I'll try and mute most everyone right. except for uh, our speaker, except for Suzanne, and then that should take care. So I'm going to be muting everyone uh, just to resolve this. Go ahead, Suzanne, as you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so um, my artwork is primarily nature art. Of course, living in Hawaii, how could it not be? Um, so I'm gonna show you um, an oil pastel. Um, there it is. Can you see it okay? Yep. Okay, yeah, that, that's a waterfall on the island of Oahu. And my mentor in doing oils and pastels was um, Stephen Sands, who has passed away. But um, I used to go down to his studio and Captain Cook, and he was such an inspiration, such a great teacher and such a kind soul. So, um, you know, thank you, Stephen. He's, he was just wonderful. So my style is my style, but yet you can see a little bit of Stephen Sands influence in, as well. So this painting was based on one of his paintings. It was such a gorgeous painting. And then of course I did it myself with oil pastels. And um, I didn't sell it because, you know, it's more representative of what he has done just to represent his work, to respect his work. So I, I have it at home in my house and I love it. <laughs> okay. So um, let me go to another um, image. Okay, here we go. Yes, when we worked this out, Suzanne and I, she found it easiest to unshare and share. So we will go back and forth. Okay. So let me show you. Um, I'll show you another oil. I'll show you the photograph first, and then I'll show you the oil that I did. I love doing waterfalls. Oh, my God. I'm just entranced with them. 
So um, this is a, a photo of Akaka Falls. And this is like over a 400 foot waterfall here on the Big Island. And it's just absolutely beautiful and magical. And um, there's the photo. And I will go ahead and change this and show you the painting. And then I'll move into my um, photography. And it's my photography I, that I love doing a lot is black and white. And I'll start with a color photo and then I'll convert it. So let me, whoops, let's see here. Let me go back. Um, I hope you guys are still there. So hold on. Um, you are, take your time. We're patient. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Not that one, hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Okay. So now let's see. Um, I was going to go to the waterfall. Okay, that's all right. I'll just go. I'll, sh I'll, I'll sure. I'm sure I'll come up on it. So let me just show you this other image. I don't know what happened. Sorry. We still see the beautiful waterfall. I know, I know. I, you know what I'll do is I'm gonna go back. Um, let me go to my other file. And then I'll be okay. Okay, okay, I see it. Take your time. While you do that, Leah, Leah yes. I wanted to mention something to the group about an opportunity. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, it'll take just a couple of seconds and, and I'll share it before because I have to jump off after that. So um, before COVID, I joined together with a group of other artists in Harlem and we began meeting and sharing studio visits and having more and more conversations together. Once COVID started, we morphed to Zoom meetings and, and we did them online. And after a couple of months of that, we felt that we needed some type of a project, some purpose, something that we could do where we would be sharing our work beyond the confines of the Zoom meeting. So we came up with this idea um, of projecting images of our work on a wall in Harlem. And when we began the process, there was a lot of reticence, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of concern that it wouldn't work, that maybe the images wouldn't read well, that nobody would be interested, a, lo a lot of pushback from concerns about something that had yet to have been tested. As it turned out, when we first announced, oh, this led us into becoming much more formal in our own structure. So we created our website, we gave ourselves the name, we uh, put together uh, bios of everybody and images of everybody's work. And suddenly this ad hoc group of friendly artists actually became something for real. When we announced that we were going to do this project, uh, and it took quite a few weeks to reach that point, we were overwhelmed by the number of other organizations that wanted to be part of it. So we ended up within the space of one week getting five sponsors for our activity. Wow. Uh, about three weekends ago, it took place on a street in Harlem at night on a Saturday night. In the course of maybe an hour and a half projection, we had about 150, 200 people who actually stopped and commented and watched the projection. Uh, it kept, it was a combination of stills and videos and it kept um, looping so that in about 20 minutes you could see it all. I mention it because that now has brought us into requesting a grant to do it again uh, in this next season. So what I felt was, it was such a, it was so hard to get it off the ground and we learned so many things from it. It would be really a wonderful idea to share this with other artists or other artist groups and say, you two can do this. It is a way to connect with people. It doesn't cost much. I was, I, I think we rented a projector for $150. And it brought everybody in the group together, gave us a common goal, and the community went bonkers for it. They absolutely loved it, and there's been tremendous feedback. So I will put in the chat the name of our group and the website. 
And I encourage anybody who would like more specific information, mm -hmm. I can put you together with some of the people who did the technical part of it. And maybe for you, your neighborhood, where you are, it too could work for you. It's a, a different approach than the virtual gallery setting. It's, it was much more, I'd say much more physical in terms of interaction. All the artists were present. We talked to everybody who was there. Okay? Very That's nice. <laughs> Uh, thank you for sharing. And yes, just like Veronica said, exhibitions were canceled. We've heard that happen to so many artists. Um, but this is a reaction to it. And that's quite brilliant. Projecting on the walls. Very smart. You have an audience, sort of a casual audience that happens to come. It's sort of bringing art off the gallery walls into the streets. It's a very smart idea. And Obviously, you were very successful, so. Yeah, it worked. It worked, and I would really encourage people to think of it as another vehicle, another tool. Uh, maybe you're not selling anything from it, but you are getting to interact and meet people. I actually have a museum curator who asked to meet me as a result of seeing my work. I would never have made that connection, so. Very nice. Yeah, can I ask you a quick question? Where do you, where do you set up the projector? I'm sorry? Where did you set up the projector? On the street? Yeah, 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 yeah. On the street. And was there somebody, that, was that like a session? Like it, it went for one hour or it went for days or? Uh... No, no, we did, we did the projection for about two hours and two hours, it okay. looped every 20 minutes. So if you were just passing by. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a great it. idea, thank you. Yeah. Right, and um, it was a projector that was high power, and you can really get a very large image depending on how far back you are. And it was very successful from the, from the point of view that we got to meet our neighbors, they got mm -hmm. to meet us, and the conversation has now begun. Very smart. Suzanne, how are you doing? Do you want to unstop screen sharing and try one more? Okay, now I can go. No, I've, I've got quite a few images I want to share. <laughs> okay, can you put them up? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just was listening to the other presenters. So, so anyway, um, this is a, a, a shot, a color shot of uh, Philanopsis orchids. Did we're that come not, through okay? No, we're not seeing, we're still seeing the uh, waterfall. Okay, so hold on. Let me see what's going on. Leah put up uh, mm -hmm. the site. It's www.artformsus.com. Artforms with an yeah. S, us.com. Okay, yeah, I don't, hold on a second. I think I've got it. There you go. Okay, so let me try. You see me now? I see yes. you now. Yes, Suzanne. <laughs> okay, so hold on. Let me just go into the next shot. Okay, so this should come through okay. Can you see that all right? Mm. Yes. Yeah, so um, that's the uh, Philanopsis orchids and that's a full color shot with a black background. And so the black, I, I actually took this at night and then darkened the background on it. So, okay. You have the unique advantage that you actually have these things growing in your backyard, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, the, the big island's full of foliage. I live up in Volcano Village, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazingly rich. Um, so, um, you know what happens is I go in here and my big fat thumb hits the wrong button. <laughs> you know, so. to, um, Jackie Beckett? Who? Uh, a woman, I think she, um, Jackie Beckett, she's a, she started to paint and your work looked familiar to me, like her work. I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know her. Oh, oh, she's a photographer too. 
Okay, so right. let me try to get back into Zoom here. I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm just such a new person at this. Um, Cause I, you can see the phalaenopsis, right? Yes. yes. Okay, so what, I, what I'm trying to do is get back into Zoom so I can change and go to you another to hit the <laughs> Hit the red button that says stop share at the top of your screen. Yeah, I know. I know, but that's not coming up. So that's my, um, that's my. Even that's if you hover doing. over it with your uh, cursor, you still don't okay. see it? Yeah, let me try. Okay, let me see. If Barry, you can back. stop the screen share for her. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know, I'm not gonna, don't do that. I know, I know what the problem is. I just need to get back into the Zoom screen. That's what I'm trying to do here. Okay, now I'm there. I got it. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm like I said. I'm just new at this mechanical Zoom thing. Okay. I've been on computers since the early '80s, but the Zoom is new. <laughs> okay, so now I'm ready to go to another image here. So hopefully, my big fat thumb won't hit the wrong thing. Okay. So here we go. Um. So let me get into my black and white. Let me see if I got. Let me go down all the way. Oh, okay, okay. There's one here. A bit start. Maybe if you put them in a folder together separately, so you can just go one to the other instead of searching, it might help. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm zooming from my phone. Okay, I'm not on my oh. computer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So here's a black and white. Um, um, this is Cataleo orchids. into another image. Okay. Michael, I have to ask you, um, how did Wendy find that first presentation by Veronica? Michael Krasowitz has presented many times, but his wife also does performance art. Yeah, no, she was really interested. It's very different for her because she's more like, uh, uh, I always put it. It was challenging for her. It was challenging work. It wasn't something she was, you know, she really didn't have a vocabulary to understand it, to be honest with you. She was like, uh, you know, it, it seemed, uh, which is good, which is fine. It, it made her feel a little uncomfortable, to be honest with you. No, that, yeah. that is good, that it expands horizons. I would say um, your wife is, comes more from dance, correct? Yeah, dance and she studied Middle Eastern dance. So she studied belly dance and things like that. So her, her th all, whole thing is about line, line and movement. So it was, it was interesting. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I, for her, I think it was a challenge and I'm glad she, she was glad to watch it. Then her daughter called her and that was that. But uh, it's different, you know, I mean, I think that's an interesting, uh, people are gonna to react to it differently. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. But uh, I think she thinks, I don't think she really understands art or performance art. And, and she's coming at it from a different point of view. You know, I mean, I, she was like, she felt it was dark for her. That's just, you know, but that's okay, you know. It's unsettling and that's good because then she'll think differently. You know, even today we did a piece together and she had this idea that she would put thorns and branches in her hair and we wind up coming up developing a whole different vocabulary which I thought was interesting anyway well art 
art at its best is unsettling. And through that, it sort of opens horizons or not, but uh, definitely very jarring and very powerful. And uh, spoke, speaks to a lot of emotions we have. Um, you know, it's interesting too. I, this, this afternoon, they had a presentation from Art in General which is a nonprofit in New York City for 40 years. And uh, they had all the people, they just closed it. I didn't know Art in General was closed. And there was a man named Paul Pfeiffer who was talking. And I thought about your work, Veronica, because he said something interesting. He said that the way he, th he thinks of art, he thinks of art as a, uh, a social group experience. And he said, if we can get away from the idea of the individual as artists and making, you know, the individual vision, we can move into this idea where art becomes uh, cooperative and, you know, it changes the paradigm about what art can be. And I, I was thinking about your work in that context, that your art is interactive and people have to become part of it. And you're, you're kind of facilitating the viewer to be trans to transform the viewer's point of view through your experience. You're not just doing it for you, you're not doing it as a statement, but you're doing it as an interactive thing. And I thought that was kind of interesting because that was what his, his idea was, was that art can be you know, transformative within the culture. So I thought that was interesting. Yes, I am. Art, art is transformative and it's political. I. You know, I appreciate all forms. I can I can sympathize with your sympathize with your uh, wife. Um, at the beginning, I did not understand understood, and I did not like performance art. But I was also only exposed to very little of it, and uh, I didn't understand it. But yeah, what I like about performance art is that you can give the meaning, and you can give the goal to eat. You can say what is it for and how is it how it is going to work if you want it to be interactive or individual or thank you. You can tell us a very pretty image here. This is uh, again an orchid. No, it's a white ginger. It's called an aapui and it has such a, a sweet gentle fragrance and right now it's actually blooming but i took this um shot some time ago and of course i have other images of them as well and then um, i did a black and white and then added some blue highlight to it so i, I currently have this in the gallery it's it's actually printed on um aluminum metal and it, it, the metal um, imagery just makes it seem like you can just touch the flower right there <laughs> Um, it's very beautiful. I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with the metal prints that are coming out, but they're very popular. Okay, so I'm going to go to, I'm gonna, I'll show you two more images and then I, I can tell there's um, more dialogue that needs to be shared today. So um, let me just go into another share here. Do you process your images? Um, I have a publisher here that publishes for me. And so um, I primarily, all my paintings are originals. I just, I just cannot go into reproducing them because I've tried um, making like gicles of them. And when I look at them, I go, oh my God, it's not the same. It's not the same energy. It's the not the same. Hard no, I, I meant your photography. Do you process with any software or are these just straight shots or yeah, no, show, not, aren't you showing us photographs, I thought, or are these paintings? Maybe okay. I misunderstood. I started out the presentation with some of my paintings and then yes. now I'm showing photos and the photos okay. are taken um, uh, photographically and then they're enhanced with, uh, um, you know, digital um, formats. So. Does that answer your question? No, I was asking really if you use Photoshop, if, are they digital or are they film, I guess would be the first question. And then do you use any software to enhance them? Yeah, I'm I, that. when I'm saying, when I'm saying um, digital, I'm referring also to the software programs. Okay. 
it yeah. Just, it does. So yeah. they're digital. Or, okay. Thank you. Uh, you're quite welcome. Okay. Thank you for asking. Let me just go back into here and go down. Okay. Okay. Can you see that one okay? Yep. Okay. So that's a blossoming um, magnolia. So it's just it's just starting to open up. Um, there's hundreds of magnolia trees here on the Big Island. And it's funny, my mom was an artist and that was always her favorite tree. And um, I don't know if you folks have had chance to get into your heredity, um, but on my mom's side of the family, there's quite a few artists and writers and so on and so forth. And a very famous one, um, who's my fifth cousin, is uh, John Singer Sargent. Wow. Uh, yeah. That, that's a wow name to have as a relative. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, those little DNA molecules that we have <laughs> to help us in our creativity. So, um, yeah. That magnolia must be, must smell beautiful, yes? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, it's funny, all the flowers have their own perfumes. I mean, you cannot say one flower smells exactly like the same. It, it just, the other one, it just does, it's not. It's amazing. It's just um, really awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go into um, more of an abstract photo. I, I shared it with Barry. Um, I'm working on a, a book right now, and um, it's going to incorporate um, poetry and prose and some narrative um, along with um, my um, artwork in different formats. But I'm going to go ahead and show this one shot, and then I'll, I'll read the, the prose that I wrote with it. So let me finally figure out how to do this correctly. Let me get down into... Okay... So the story behind this, before you see this, is pretty amazing. We have the Bear, Merry Monarch Festival. Of course, we didn't have it last year because of the pandemic. Um, but um, it's a celebration of Hula, and it celebrates our fire goddess, who was like Gaia, um, Madame Pele. So we have Halals that come from all over the world uh, to, to perform here in Hilo. So it's a special week. Um, the opening starts on Easter Sunday, and then it goes that entire week. And as you get more towards the middle of the week, it really picks up because Wednesday night is free performance night. And then there's three nights of competition. Um, and then it closes um, on Saturday evening. So this, this photograph, I took this back in 2016 and I've hardly showed it to anybody. I don't, it's, in fact, I actually contacted an editor of a magazine and, um, she didn't see the image. There was some legal stuff I wasn't happy with, so I just kind of backed out of it. But um, let me go into, let's see, am I in my, yeah, I'm in my camera. So on Tuesday evening, I'm driving home to Volcano Village, and outside of the post office that I've stopped many times at night, um, I have never seen anything like this. And um, Two weeks after the event, and I went back, the figure that you'll see was completely gone. And I, I, I parked my car and something told me just to turn my head. And I turned my head and I looked at this tree. And um, I'll show you what I saw. I just have to get in the right year. Here we go, we're almost there. Okay, so this is, this is the shot with a little bit of red highlight. Um, And um, there's a, a forest goddess, and her name is Hiiaka. And Hiiaka and Madame Pele were always at odds with each other. <laughs> so what happened with this shot is um, maybe about a week later, I was in the post office in the afternoon, and I really didn't pay um, much attention to the tree. I just was in the post office, and there was this auntie, a Hawaiian lady there, and she was upset. So I, w I walked up to her and kind of gave her a hug and uh, 
obviously pre-pandemic, <laughs> gave her a hug and I said, oh, auntie, how are you? And then we started talking and I said, well, can I share something with you? Because she was Hawaiian and I thought this is the right person to show this to and the first person I ever showed it to at that time. And I showed it to her and she goes, oh, my kai'i. She goes, oh, what a gift. I said, I know, auntie. I said, it's just amazing what happened. She says, no, that was a gift for you. You were supposed to see that. And two weeks later, after the event of seeing that tree, I went back and I looked at the tree with intention of doing so. And there was nothing there. Absolutely no image of a human body or anything. It was completely gone. So <laughs> it, it was it was pretty magical, and I'll show you um, I'll show you a black and white of it, and then I'll I'll read the um, the prose I wrote to go along with it. So let me just go back into here. So that one person who asked me that question, I use uh, Photoshop a lot, you know, when I want to make some enhancements on the image. Um, it seems to work really well and I like using it. It's not difficult to use. And, uh, I like the effects I get from it. Yeah, I, I'm a photographer uh, at this stage of my life and do a lot of Photoshop. I, I actually teach it. So that's why I was curious to know. Uh -huh. If they were the raw image or, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, no, go ahead. Oh, no, no, that's okay. Please ask anytime. Okay, so I'll show you the black and white and uh, hopefully you'll notice more of her facial features. We could see at the bottom, it looks like Beautiful. a left leg crossed over a right leg, almost yep. a, a torso, the two arms, you know, one sort of waving up a little, um, and then, you know, the spot where the head would be. Um, as I said, when Susan showed me this, when you look at nature, when you look at clouds, when you look at puddles, you can see a lot of different forms, as in a raw shot, because forms are generic, and they're generic shapes, and they can be read many different ways. So sometimes we've seen artists who present um, acrylic pores and different techniques and styles. And if it, the work is general enough, you can see human bodies, you can see faces. Somehow that'll come out. You just have to look up at clouds and play that game where you try and spot an image and see it and see if your friend can see it. So certainly in trees, you know, Susan felt, Suzanne felt, you know, a direct connection with this. And of course she couldn't see it later, which is very interesting, but it's good that you captured it. In yeah. this photo, I like the sort of play on the horizon line of what must have been buildings in the background. And you get those little dots, it gives you great depth. You know, the foreground obviously has that tree pushed forward, um, but that it's very interesting. Those little dots, almost like Mondrian plays in the background. Yeah, or you could, or on a spiritual plan, you could call them orbs. <laughs> sure. Okay, so here, here's the prose I wrote. Um, and I wrote this, oh, on the 8th of October because um, there's some times when you get up in the morning, you just need a little bit, for me being in nature, some nurturing from nature. And uh, I love to hug trees. And there's one particular tree. It's this big, huge, giant sugi pine um, that I like to hug. So I, <laughs> I went out there and talked to him or her and hugged him or her and for quite some time. And then I came, as I did that, all of a sudden I get this in inspiration for this prose. And then what I do is when I write them, and then I'll go into my imagery um, photography or paintings and I'll find something that, you know, reflects um, what I wrote. So um, this definitely will be part of um, the book I'm writing along with this, this imagery. So here it is. So it's called Arms of the Tree. They wrap around me and reach up to the stars. 
I hug them with my mind and heart. Their creatures sing morning songs to the rising sun and sing good night to the heavens above. They communicate with each other through the roots in the earth and share stories of their ancestors when it was only them and their sisters and brothers of nature who were the only ones existing on the planet. What a glorious time of peace. Very nice. Very nice. There was a comment from Susan uh, Tiffin. This is, a, this is the spiritual image, beautiful work. Um, Thank you, Susan. Nice. I'll, I'll just ask if there are any questions and then we will wrap it up because we have gone a little bit over. And I do see the face, it's funny. When we looked at this in a practice Zoom, for the life of me, I could not see the face you were talking about now. I certainly see it, um, and it makes sense. So I'm, I'm just listening to see if anyone wanted to ask me anything. <laughs> I'll open it up back to the group. I want to thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Barry. It's, you know, it's more along the lines of nature and conservative work and um, presentations I, I've seen from um, uh, today from Veronica and a couple of weeks ago from another artist that was a performance artist. And it was like pretty amazing and, and beautiful and creative and at the same time painful. Uh, with the emotions that it, it that it brings up for all of us that are viewing it. And, um, you know, for me, nature is very, very, very healing. And I know it's hard when you live in a city with lots of concrete. And all I can say to folks out there, get out in nature as much as you can, because it truly, truly is, is beautiful and nurturing. I think you hit an important point there. Your setting, your environment is very important. And uh, there's no question about it. You know, you're having 18, 18 months to sort of sail around, settling in Hawaii, being surrounded by the luscious landscape. That impacts you. And likewise, an asphalt jungle that we live in in the cities has an impact, and that is going to affect the art that we create. But in the end, we're all artists. This is how we react to our environment. It's healing. Nature is healing. For you and for Veronica, the experience that she goes through is not only healing for us, but it's awakening for the viewer. So I think as, as we always come to this point, there's never one way to art, no one right way. They're all different paths. And it's really for you as the artist to choose your path. And everybody here has chosen different paths. Um, I want to thank you all. This is Artist Talk on Art. Um, this is great. We value your time. We do it every Monday. Spread the word. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for uh, coming in and dealing with the technical problems. Thank you. And Veronica, thank you for sharing a you know, brilliant presentation, very deep. And uh, I'd say to all you artists, just keep exploring. Keep going. Yes, we all have butterflies. We all have doubts. We all have problems with our art but just persevere. You gotta keep going at it. And you know, your art will evolve and grow and change in the best of ways. And that's a theme. We've all had shows canceled, or at least many people have had shows canceled. But look at what Leah Paula said as sort of how they, you know, transformed that. And all of a sudden they came up with something altogether new. So we're good at making solutions. Thank you all for coming. Join us next Monday. It's going to be very exciting. And, you know, feel free to contact me uh, if, if your emails, if you're not on our email list or anything with any question. There's a lot going on. We're trying to open up our own uh, gallery inside the ATOA. And uh, who knows? We may take Leah's idea and one day project those images. I think it's a smart idea. So thank you all. Thanks, Barry. Thank you.
Bye-bye. 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 Aloha. Aloha. Bye.